so yeah, yeah. so this yeah. is for those that are just joining us this is future now better fashion futures now and today i'm joined by jane mcmillan and for those of you that don't know jane i'm going to invite her to give you a little bio in a moment but basically jane is a fantastically talented fashion designer, textile designer, and guru on entrepreneurship with a really strong interest in sustainability. So Jane, can you tell us a bit about how you got involved with fashion and textiles? So I, start, I started my business originally making delicate floaty chiffon dresses. So I started about 1997, 1996 maybe even, um, and I wanted to do prints. So I started working, I was selling in Kosamui in Covent Garden and the owner, Paul Sexton at the time, he knew this print designer. So he suggested that we work together. So he put me in touch with the print designer and we had a meeting, we were all ahead. We had this project set up, we knew what we were, what we were doing. And then suddenly he called one day to say he could no longer do it because he'd fallen out with his boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> he was too <laughs> devastated to continue. So. Yeah. So basically then I thought, well, okay, can I start to do some digital prints? I knew nothing about it, but I knew less about screen printing. So I just started playing around on Photoshop. And at the time I was actually still working in a nine to five. So I didn't have time to go out looking for fabrics anyway. So I started playing around on Photoshop and developing just some basic prints. At that time, 1998 probably, digital print was only being used on t-shirts and just some basic items so I wasn't very sure at all how receptive it would be on my silk dresses um, but it worked out well and then over the years I just developed the basic prints and they became a little bit more sophisticated um, because back then at that time digital printing was really new and the prints were so pixelated so you basically you couldn't have large areas of color because it would be so pixelated and um, you had to have lots of small areas of the color the process wasn't nearly as refined as it is now um, and it took me several seasons to get the hang of working with the the process as it was in those days and getting basically developing Photoshop, which was a new skill to me at that time too. So that was basically the starting point. Brilliant. And, and, then, and then grew it from there. And so you've seen, you've been there really since the start of digital print design and you've mm -hmm. seen the evolution and that, that journey. And um, I mean, when I think to your work, I think, yes, I think to digital prints, I think to these stunning and highly original um, prints, the likes of which I've never seen on textiles before your work was sometimes inspired by art wasn't it i know that you were very influenced by that yeah um and your color palettes are sublime i mean you really are sort of a grand master of color um where did you draw your inspiration from uh obviously the world of art but you know what was infusing yeah. your work um the initial well basically because i was working in a nine to five at the time my inspiration was literally whatever was closest to me so um, I think the very first few collections, one was a flower that I had taken a photograph, a camellia that I had photographed in Scotland. And that basically was formed the basis of many prints. I developed it in so many different ways. Um, another was, it was a piece of um, like antique embroidery that I had found in Port Portobello Market at the bottom of this bucket. And it was, it was so old, the fabric was basically just fading away. It was just destroyed around this beautiful piece of embroidery so I basically scanned that in and that became the basis of several prints as well and um, so yeah it could be nature it could be flowers it could be art it could be bits of embroidery and I think one was even from a coaster a coffee coaster <laughs> yeah um, and then goodness I think one was New York bridges <laughs> yeah um, so lots of different so many different things exactly yes and you yeah. were um is it, am I right, thinking you trained at London College of Fashion? I did. Or, yeah. You did. Yep. Yeah. You did. 1985. So you had the, um, you had that sort of formal foundation, but then very much when you started your own business, you were a pioneer. You were, you were playing around with something that hadn't, I'm guessing, hadn't actually been taught on the course. As you say, you were, you were learning Photoshop, you were learning yeah. digital print design. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it was yeah. a whole, whole new sort of venture. And it were during your fashion career obviously you showed in new york mm -hmm. you showed in uh, you know during london and paris fashion week you were lauded by the late great 
Hilary Alexander, um, <laughs> you have very much worked at the heady heights of fashion. You've had your work in the top glossies and you know, you've pretty much been there, done it, got the t-shirt, I think it's fair to say, at that high end. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about, you know, um, kind of you, you went from college, you set up your startup, you went into fashion after a lot of hard work and experimentation, mm -hmm. it took off. Um, and reflecting on, if you like, the sort of the, the interim period between then and now, what would be your reflections on how the fashion industry has changed on what sort of big movements have been? Yeah, it's from when I started, it's, it's like a completely different landscape in the past. Well, when I, the first shift I noticed was probably the late 90s. And then I suddenly noticed this. This was before I even started my business. I noticed the shift from the focus being on the designer to being on public relations and marketing. That was the first shift I noticed. And then through my business, it was pretty much the same. I don't think there were many changes, but it was just towards the end. I think it was late 2000s. There was quite a big shift going on then. I think a lot of the boutiques started closing down. So we had like Koh Samui, a la mode, um, the, is it Louisa? I can't remember the, the French, the, the brilliant French department, the little little boutique. She closed down. There were so many around that time. I think there were huge rent increases. We had that recession and the product prices were increasing such a lot. And then the customers' values were changing because they were on social media. They wanted experiences that they could photograph for social media. So instead of buying the £3,000 handbag or dress they were putting their money into experiences so that was one change um, and then in in startups I noticed it's more recently it's become so much easier to actually start because when I started we had no way to reach the consumer I used to dream about reaching the consumers <laughs> we had these gatekeepers so you had to go through the buyers and it was the top the most influential buyers and the most influential press that would decide who was actually going to get put into the stores um and you had to get through that barrier and the public the actual consumers they at that time they all wanted to buy huge big labels they wanted big brand names so it was difficult for small brands whereas now you can start number one with a tiny budget we had to produce 30 plus piece collections or the buyers just would not take you seriously yeah but now yeah now the, you're you're just reaching the consumer directly so you could start with just one piece you don't need to invest this huge amount of energy and money into huge 30 40 piece collection I and mean, you don't even need to do catwalk shows now you, there are so many different things that you can do on a small budget uh, even the digital fashion shows and, and so many different areas yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I'd agree. When when I think over the past sort of a couple of decades, fashion, it is practically unrecognisable in that, you know, like you, I ran my own independent label uh, straight out of fashion college, uh, straight out of my design bachelor's. And uh, it was tough because you had to, as you say, you had to do your minimum, minimum units. Yeah. You had to buy a minimum amount yeah. of fabric. Uh, <laughs> you had to do all... <laughs> You had to do all the illustrations and then you had to do the cut the patterns, you had to grade the patterns, you had to sew up the samples. I got help for that. I was very lucky. My my head of production was the ex head of production for Norman Hartnell and Hardy oh. Amos among other companies. So, you know, she I just gave her the sort of the sketches and you know, the sort of the details and she she'd rustle these things up. Um, but it was still very expensive, it was difficult like you. I had to do physical shows. I had to sort of pay the whole expense of that. And it meant that, goodness me, I mean, it was, you were sort of trying to juggle all these balls, weren't you? You were trying to sort of do the creative stuff. You were trying to do the marketing yeah. stuff, the PR stuff and the finance and all the rest of it. And, you know, that's what sort of drove me to buying. And so like you, I remember I, I went to the buying team at Debenhams when Debenhams was just in the transition period from being completely uncool. It was so uncool that when yeah. we rocked the fashion trade shows, they wouldn't let us on. <laughs> they would like, see your badge. Debenhams, you're not coming on the stand. But within a year, we turned that around. And that was when that was when sort of the, the diffusion lines were coming mm -hmm. in, the John Roches, the Pierce Beyonders. Uh -huh. So that was very much a sort of retail transformation. But, yeah. you know, when I think today, like you, I remember 
Um, what effectively Debenhams was trying to do was to kind of create these sort of bespoke units, sort of mimicking, if you like, the Koh Samui, yeah. these sort of chic boutiques. And then it was very personal and it was a very um, sort of intimate experience, wasn't it? When you go into a, a boutique mm. and they'd have some unique things. And of course, the sales rep is there to tell you it looks amazing. <laughs> Whether or not it always <laughs> does or not, they make you feel a million dollars. Um, they'd of course have great lighting, always mm. great lighting in the changing rooms. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, <laughs> But today it is completely different. And I've noticed that even some of the very best boutiques have not made it. They, like you say, yeah. they've gone out of business. Yeah. Um, and so right now, you know, we've got the situation, obviously the high street has been sort of, it's an exodus, it's kind of tumbleweed. Tumbleweed's a great name, yeah. <laughs> but you've, also, you've got this sort of, this, this new sort of frontier of creativity, haven't you? Because um, effectively what we've got is this digital space where people can actually create a lot of things much more uh, autonomously. So they can actually create their marketing and their imagery and all of this, and they rustle it up with an app. Um, and so it kind of brings back that control. But what do you think, um, in terms of what the big challenges are now, obviously in some ways it's, it's way easier. I mean, the point of entry is, would have been a dream, as you say, to our younger selves. Yeah. But what do you think now are the really big challenges for those people that are getting into into the business yeah well i think coming into it, it is so much easier because of the, the lower barrier of entry i mean the cost is almost zero to start yeah. compared to what it was then and um, but it will be getting more competitive obviously the more people that come in the more competitive it will get but it's interesting what you said about Devons. that that just reminded me because of course they were at the forefront of these collaborations with young designers and that to me is how i see the future because I think without that, the big companies risk just becoming dinosaurs. But if they start working with young designers, either as partnerships or sponsorships, to, to, to promote them, either in their own stores or in a completely separate space, it could be... I mean, for example, in London, we have these beautiful... In London and also in Leeds, and I'm sure other cities too, we have these really beautiful historic arcades. And they could be developed into some lovely experiential shopping experience where it's the, where the big luxury brands or the big high street um, brands where they're actually working with the young brands and then they're feeding off each other. The large brands, they can get the, the, the street cred from the young brands and the young brands get the finance that they really need. Uh, and that's how I see the future where they're basically helping each other. Um, I think when we do, we have collaborations at the moment, but it's like Zara collaborating with one of my CSM alumni, Susan Fang. And then we have collaborations where they collaborate with artists. Um, but I just see so much more, especially luxury brands, like maybe like the Louis or the Pradas, working with young designers that, that, are, that are aligned with their vision. And um, that's how I see the future as the collaborations, basically. Yeah. And, and I'd agree with that, actually, because thinking about that, if you look to a lot of luxury brands, notably LVMH and um, I'm thinking there's also actually not just luxury groups, but also books like Tashin um, and some of the other mm -hmm. sort of luxury publishers that are very strongly associated with fashion. Yeah. They are now creating what you might call talent incubators. They're collaborating with uh, creatives typically sort of crafts types yeah. of projects, but I think there's lots of scope for fashion. And, uh, you know, and that for them, it's actually a way for them to explore the leading edge ideas, things like biodesign, biomaterials and so forth, without actually having to sort of R&D that process internally. They can literally, they can work with the experts yeah. that, that are at the forefront, um, experiment. And I love your idea about the arcades. I mean, I'm thinking of Burlington the Arcade on that's, the, on the that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just uh, your mind's there, uh, telep telepathic. Um, I'm thinking I can see that. And I, and I guess sort of, you know, a lot of people think that the high street has died and that in-person experience has died. Um, but I guess what we're sort of, we're entering is this new domain now because we've simultaneously got the capacity that you can make the clothing bespoke or the apparel uh, sort of accessories, whatever it might be. Yeah. Everything you can make bespoke. Yeah. You, can, you can print or or manufacture a one-off yeah uh you can um customize it and so that it's it infuses the designer's expertise but simultaneously it creates that uniqueness yeah it's going to fit great 
and it's going to look great and it's going to be a bit special because it is a one-off um and so that whole experience i think could be really exciting um in the physical ex physical space and that kind of leads us into sustainability yeah. because of course the other big change that we've seen is that whereas of old i mean yeah your, your high street garments were at price points that were lower than your chanel <laughs> you know your, your yeah. runway precipitate yeah, yeah. or whatever exactly. but nonetheless obviously we, we we very quickly entered that sort of primark era when the price drops the, the price points drop right down fast fashion obviously we've also seen the sort of the migration well for a period we saw the migration of the the production out to china um increasingly to bangladesh and, and turkey yeah. um so the rise of sweatshop labor and now i think what's really interesting is we're sort of seeing these bespoke facilities pop up that bring that manufacturing back. Yeah. Um, we were talking uh, um, uh, earlier about Contrado, weren't we, and about yeah. the Contrado model. And what are your thoughts on the potential of something like Contrado for um, the future of fashion brands and consumption? Yeah, I think, I think companies like Contrado, it does open it up to anybody, um, which I think is great. So anyone can literally set up a business. Um, the only problem as I might see is that then uh, how different can it be how original can it be so then we're back to the, the the original designers setting up I think what I see that's one section that will grow <laughs> considerably another section that I actually would love to see I am seeing it but only in little droplets I'd love to see it expand into an ocean <laughs> is basically working more of like the cottage industry way of working um, I've been following this young designer. Her name's Hope McCauley. I don't know if you've seen her. I've not seen her. She, okay, she went viral on TikTok and on Instagram. She's doing amazing things. So she started selling her college graduate collection. It was these really colourful, really oversized, chunky knits. Um, so she started selling that and it just went viral. But I love the way, I love her business model and the way she works because she trains local artisans, local knitters in Northern Ireland, her home, near her hometown. And she trains them herself to her unique way of knitting. Um, and I just love that idea. So it's keeping it close to her. She has more control of it. And then these home workers have an income that they might not necessarily have had. And I think that could be the future. I actually, I was in the US just a few weeks ago and I was talking to a lady there called Kari. And she makes these um, like um, religious vestments, um, like clerical outfits. And she basically, she works to a similar model. She basically outsources the sewing and the embroideries to out workers working in their own homes. And she's doing so well. Well, she, she produces them and sells them, but she also teaches other people how to do it. Um, so it's basically, basically retaining old crafts, bringing back these old craft that would otherwise die because it takes a long time the embroidery it, it's quite a long laborious process that she's doing and i'd love to see more of that which is the complete opposite of the primarks that we've had since what the 90s when it all it went i remember when it all started and um every, when i when i left college and when i was at college it was cool to wear second hand it was really cool <laughs> yeah and then suddenly yeah. Yeah, suddenly I remember the interns coming in when I was working at Ali Capolino and the interns would come in, everything had to be new, 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 new. And I said, oh, hold on. <laughs> That's not <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> no, no. It became cool, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, that's interesting what you say because um, the... Um, the Bio Future session on Thursday is with uh, a really exciting designer called Susanna Radneva. And uh, she is she grew up in an indigenous tribe in Siberia, ah. traditional tribe where they they wear all these amazing, beautiful yeah. clothes that you might well, see in some yeah. epic costume drama. Yeah. And she's got a label whereby although she's infusing it with bio design, with bio materials, she's actually reinventing the historic costumes of her peoples i love it so she's trained in the techniques of creating these um you know ornate sort of um very uh, oriental style garments mm -hmm. but she's then actually splicing that with brand new sort of emerging um textiles bio material textiles mm -hmm. and it's a localized model so her vision is very much what you're speaking to she's she's taking the sort of the best of the old she's splicing it with the best of the new both in bio design and digital 
And um, this whole model is extremely sustainable because she's basically closing the gap of the, um, the expanse from where the, the, the source materials come from yeah. and the labor is situated. She's bringing it locally. And so she's also tackling social issues as well. And the other thing I love about all this and, and the, the case study you just gave is the fact that one of the things that the fashion big companies used to do, and you'll remember all the legal cases about this, <laughs> is they would take a sort of a, an indigenous kind of motif or mm -hmm. lace style production mm -hmm. or embroidery style. And then they basically send those garments off to their factories. Yeah. And then they say, right, copy yeah. that. <laughs> I know. There's no credit even to the actual creator, the actual no. designer. In, no, they, they would just, they, yeah. yeah, they would just they'd appropriate it, wouldn't they? They'd appropriate the design. And also, I guess, I guess the shift we're sort of seeing, and I was thinking about this more generally, is that we've had an economy of extraction. We've had an economy where if you think about the Primark model, I mean, I don't want to knock them too much because, you know, fair enough that there will have been good things that they did and so on. Mm -hmm. But, um, the bottom line is that they were looking to others for the original concepts. Mm -hmm. It was other creatives, other design teams. I mean, I can say this actually, when I was at Debenhams, the whole design team was fired. I was horrified about it. Really? Because of course, yeah, the entire design department was, 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 was closed down. And it was because of the fact that obviously that whole process by then, by then they were able to actually um, basically, they yeah appropriate other people's designs, mix them up, and they all they really needed was the pattern cutters and the graders and the kind of the, the tech folks. So, um, oh my goodness. we kind of we got to the stage where the, the kind of creative skill yeah. was being appropriated, it was being commercialized, it was being yeah. flogged on the cheap, and that reminds me of the AI model because right now we've got AI and companies that will copy creative work, monetize it, <laughs> and not even so much as give credit. You exactly. know. but this exactly. is other. This model that we're speaking to here and that Susanna and, and the other example you, you gave um, illustrate yeah. is actually taking control again, isn't yeah. it? And it's giving ownership back yeah. and it's making it fair and equitable. Yeah. Well, see, it's a similar thing in Mexico. I went to visit the indigenous tribes in the mountainous villages in Mexico and the work they do is amazing. And they do it on that basically a dirt floor on this backstrap loom. They live in it's basically just freeze brick walls and um, dirt floor just basic furniture and then they'll have some religious things on the walls and that's their life and they're not they're so talented but they're not actually getting paid uh a, a, you know a good enough money for the for the, for the work that they do and um, so there are cooperatives setting up to actually utilize the skills of these people but uh, which is great but I don't know how much is going to the owners of the cooperative. That's just my personal view. I don't know how much is going to the owners of the cooperative and how much is actually going to the artisans. Um, mm. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but absolutely. nevertheless, at least something is starting to, to, to kind of happen to, 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 to help the indigenous tribes retain their, their design skills. Yeah. And, and, you know, these crafts, I mean, they take years, don't they? They take years to develop, to, yeah, to yeah. perfect it to that incredible scale. So they do absolutely, they need to be remunerated. And uh, I hope that um, the transparency that is now coming in, I mean, fashion, I think, got a, away with a lot for a long time. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it's fair to say we were aware of a lot of the problems of decades ago. We, yeah. we knew that there was exploitation. We knew that there were issues. Um, yeah. And it's kind of one of the reasons I moved on to other industries. I mean, yes, I moved on because I was sort of, I was frustrated by the kind of the, the general sort of slowness of fashion to embrace some things. But, um, you know, I remember sort of, you know, writing articles about the issue of fashion ethics and sustainability yeah. and kind of highlighting that, you know, it, it didn't matter how many times an issue was flagged, you were still getting anorexic models in, yeah. in Vogue or in, in the magazine. Yeah. She was still getting sweatshop labor scandal break and it was well when is fashion going to take responsibility yeah it feels like it's kind of turning a corner do you do you think that what do you think the sort of status is at the moment um i think well kind of going on from that copyright issue <laughs> um which we're just saying well it was always a problem but clothes cannot be copyright because they're legally classified as as utility garments because they can't there's no copyright protection for clothes um but 
it doesn't matter anymore either because of AI everything is just completely open I don't know how copyright is going to, to kind of be, be <laughs> how it's going to work in the future but I just came to the conclusion because there's you cannot do anything about people copying your ideas mm. you either hide them and have <laughs> and, and sell nothing or you put them out there and get them copied you know so at the conclusion I came to years ago it's not about one single design people don't care about your design it's about the brand so it's just about building a brand and with AI I was just thinking this morning AI is going to make and with Contrado it's even more not about the product and more about the brand because more people with companies like Contrado more people can anyone can basically have a design business and they can all have similar products so it's more important to have an actual brand so you're selling the brand rather than any product that, yeah, that's how I see it yeah. and I guess having the, the kind of the brand values I mean it was always the case that I think it's fair to state that when people bought high purchase uh, items when they bought a luxury bag or they bought um you know a luxury coat yeah. or whatever it was and they paid way above the cost of the sort of typical high street item it was always for the brand there was an always an element of buying the kudos yeah you might you, you like the look of it but you want to be affiliated with that mm. and i guess that's another interesting thing about fashion because back in the day you know back when liz Tilbaris was the editor of vogue etc um there was very much this sort of um, period when the fashion editorials were about creating these virtual worlds, these highly curated, very artistic um, spreads that basically involved a lot of teamwork. There were a lot of people involved yeah. and they, they were sublime works. I mean, it really, I think it was, it was sort of the height of fashion photography and that there was a lot of originality in the techniques, te techniques came through. Yeah. But today, of course, we've got a sort of a flip on that because today, um, you know, the individuals, they can be much more proactive on creating the brand, can't they? Because they've got the platforms, they've got Instagram, which we're using right now. Um, and they've got all the sort of the tools that they can mm -hmm. use. Um, so they don't need to hire a PR company, a marketing company. They don't have to have a photo mm -hmm. shoot. They can literally just kind of do it themselves. But then I guess the other thing about fashion and the arts and about people is that we do like the new, don't we? We like, we like change. Yeah. We like, we like sort of, shifting concepts and ideas so yeah. um what do you think about you know what how do you think things might emerge i mean when you think sort of the future of fashion let's say in 15 years time yeah what do you think is going to stay and what what do you think might go well i've found it really refreshing over the past like three years to see young designers literally just set up from their bedroom or whatever just sewing something just throwing one piece and start starting a business selling it um, and a lot of them are using recycled so that they don't even have to pay for materials they are using recycled garments and materials and um, bedspreads curtains tablecloths to make the most beautiful garments to me that it's very refreshing and that's new at the moment that feels very new it won't for very long and um, and also it's not scalable so it's how far can they go with it they would have to then get some either diversify into something else or or collaborate with a bigger brand so that's one way i see it, the more authentic almost going back to how businesses started 80 years ago like ralph lauren started selling just ties <laughs> um which you know over the past 50 years that would never that wasn't the way business was done so it's going back to that slow way of starting a business kind of more authentic and um, then on the other side we've got nfts and digital fashion shows and digital fashion shows <laughs> so that's going to get huge um which i'm not into at the moment but i feel it's <laughs> you're excited it's kind of, about it yeah, yeah I, am I guess excited. it's kind of the new medium isn't it yeah. i mean it, well it's the new old medium obviously it's not that new it was knocking around in the 90s <laughs> but i guess again it's about accessibility isn't it it's about the fact that a lot of people can work with that whereas back in those days it was only a very small number of people that had access to this this software to this tech yeah. um and i was thinking you know we were talking about collaborations and historically fashion has been very very highly associated with our in other industries particularly yeah. music uh fashion's played a really seminal role i think it's fair to stay in the in the careers of many artists david bowie freddie mercury uh you know others and often there is a seminal designer like 
Freddie Mercury and Sandra Rhodes, obviously a, a long ongoing relationship. Um, and you could argue that, you know, that was part of his success, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Because he wore amazing costumes that could get everybody's attention yeah. to this tiny figure on this big stage with 20, 30,000 people watching. Um, what sort of um, collaborations do you sort of see emerging? Or see, you've spoken to digital. How do you think fashion might also sort of emerge artistically? Uh, you know, what, what do you think the sort of the next waves yeah. might be? That, that's a really great question. Um, because over the past, I don't know, 10 years, maybe more, um, there's not much more you can actually do with clothing. Even at St Martins, I was teaching at St Martins, even there, you could see that the designers were using, you know, it might be a wooden chair thrown over someone's neck or a dress made from raw meat or someone just carrying an oversized coat hanger. There's very little that can be expanded on or done now with clothing, very, very little. So I think the future, um, it's not really in designing the clothes. It could be somewhere in it's and the innovation could be in designing new processes, almost like what Izumiyaki did, because Izumiyaki wasn't really famous for his design of clothes as such. It was yeah. more about the processes and the innovation of new materials. Um, so I see something along those lines, like new sustainable, innovative ways of, of creating new materials or recycling materials or using recycled using old garments or, or products to actually re reinvigorate them um, that's how I see one future <laughs> um, that, 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 that can be innovative um, and also I think yeah actually if I look back to around was it 2008 2009 around about that time so I was actually teaching the students at St Martin's College this new <laughs> then sustainable um, way of working and we did one of the projects and um, there were three different areas one project was uh, zero waste cutting uh, and I remember so it's basically cutting out with no waste whatsoever so you're utilizing every single millimeter of the material in the garment and one of the so it is quite a challenge but one of the students I remember Tina Eileen so she had created she used origami shapes so Tina Eileen what over a decade later she's now with me in Fashion Entrepreneurs Academy and she, she worked as a photographer so she didn't actually do much with her work but now she's going back to her college project this zero waste cutting and she's using it with this origami method so she's using every single millimeter of the material um, and when she sells a design then the customer has two choices they can either have they can have it repaired she has a repair service but she also has a service where she can redesign with the material because because there's no waste it's all from the the, the whole meterage the whole square of material she can take it apart and redesign a new garment from the same material and um, so i think that's another way forward we're utilizing um things i think was it ellen MacArthur and the the um the business of fashion and she was talking about the, the circular process being three three different areas so one was um not polluting one was the, one was um the uh, well it includes zero waste but basically being less wasteful with everything uh, and the other one was regenerative so she talked a lot about that which i found really interesting um so because if we eliminate waste and pollution through the actual designs um including zero waste cutting so that every piece is used. Um, or also, one thing she was talking about also was reducing the plastic fibres by using the organic materials. And yeah, so basically it just create a whole less wasteful economy, which I've always been into all throughout my business. It was about zero, <laughs> as little waste as possible. Well. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I mean, you know, what you were saying about um, sort of upcycling, I mean, I am someone I don't buy very often, but when I do buy, I keep things a long time, so long <laughs> that I literally have dresses that I bought at 18, 17 years old. Yeah. They're, they're vintage pieces. That, that's how old I am. I've got my <laughs> vintage pieces that I bought. But I hate to throw things out. And um, a couple of, about two years ago, I was, I was uh, walking to a dinner party. I was walking up a friend's drive and I've got some shoes that I literally again bought when I was 18. A couple of, uh, sort of heeled stilettos. Yeah. and the straps broke and um 
I was horrified. And what it was, they were actually, they are, they are made of synthetic, so they're not leather. Mm -hmm. um, I've got leather shoes from that time that they still, they, they still, yeah. you know, are just as yeah. good because they, I've taken care of them. But the straps broke. And I sort of looked at this, this pair of shoes and I thought, okay, so the straps are broken, but the heel and the sole is still in great shape. <laughs> Now I've stored them, I've sort of hoarded them, hoarded them because I thought I'm loath to throw them away when, when most of the shoe is still yeah. Yeah. brilliant. And I sort of feel that, you know, I mean, the reason I don't want to throw them away, I don't want to give them to charity because I know that they wouldn't be able to sell them unless something was done mm -hmm. with them. I don't want to throw them away. And I'm thinking I, I might upcycle them, but ideally what I really need is somebody that sets up an upcycling sort of business uh -huh. and then I can just donate that and other things because realistically I could probably do with a clear up but I, I will not send it to landfill because that's completely yeah. <laughs> against my religion. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people would be very willing to donate to, yeah. a, a, to a good upcycling company so it's not as if they would have to invest in because that would be not commercially viable but yes so many people would like you just, just be willing to donate um, yeah, that, that could be, that could be a risk. Yeah. And Hopefully really if there's good. anyone out there, let us know and we will put it on our social media because, you know, yeah. that, that could be handy. Yeah. Um, I, think I think it's a mindset change for designers as well because, I mean, do you really feel good about yourself designing throwaway, like thousands of pieces of throwaway fashion where everyone's wearing the same thing and mm. um, that's quite often using unethical production methods? Or do you feel better to yourself and more proud if you're actually designing something that has long-term value, like the leather shoes, you have yeah. that last for, you know, more years, decades even than the synthetic ones. Um, so it is just about everyone, you know, changing their mindset and educating everyone, just encouraging everyone and, and educating them on the positive, the positive aspects of working differently. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, it, I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I think I think throughout our sort of careers, we've worked with some very different sort of techniques and ideas. And yeah. what you often find with fashion is that people are trying to sort of embrace just one idea. So it's it's either that, you know, it's going to last forever or it's going to. I mean, you know, one of my college projects back in 1994 and five was creating a biodegradable fashion collection that would degrade at the end of the season and be reabsorbed by the environment. Now, that obviously would have a context but then again um there are some items that it actually make sense to last forever so i mean i sort of i look at the future of fashion and i think there's no one way here there's there's this ecosystem of different approaches and all of them are, are equally valid in their own way aren't they they're just they have different contexts really that they apply for different scenarios yeah no i, I completely agree yeah it's um yeah yeah <laughs> That's a pretty good argument. How how long do we want things to last? Um, yeah, because we're saying that some things are not sustainable because they do last too long and we can't destroy them. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the other hand, we're that's talking the about... one extreme. <laughs> yeah. Plastics that stick around for thousands of years don't want that. And then at the other end of the yeah. extreme, you're like, oh goodness, well you know if it breaks too early, <laughs> then that's, that's, that's about that. Yeah. So if it lasts, I don't know, like. Well, I suppose it's how it degrades, it, like leather would eventually degrade mm -hmm. with us, the plastics. And I just remember when I was in Mexico, or well, before COVID, so maybe five years ago, and beautiful, beautiful beach. And one year I went the whole beach, right along the beachfront, it was just covered in plastic bottle, plastic sandal, plastic bit of somebody's chair. I mean, the whole beachfront just rubbish washed in from this i mean it was so sad mm. it was plastic this plastic that the whole I and mean, we almost fossilized bits of plastic yeah that you know the kind of it's actually happening that that yeah. is a geological process right now they're saying humanity will have left a, 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 a mm. sort of a its mark in the geological record because the plastics are getting literally layered up it's that's, just, what it, yeah, that's what it looked like mm. yeah and it was so sad to to see on this beautiful beach um mm. so yeah i mean so we don't we don't want them to stay around for <laughs> forever <laughs> yeah. and i guess that you know that's the other thing about sort of sustainable fashion because when it comes to plastics obviously there there were a lot of companies that got very into the recycling of plastics weren't there they were sort of they oh we've taken plastic bottles and we've recycled them yeah. into for sake of argument a fleece yeah 
Um, now, that would have all seemed well and good at the time, but for the fact that, of course, now the realisation has come, oh, the fleeces shed micro and nanoplastic particles when uh -huh. they go through the wash cycle. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. yes, you can put the filter into the washing machine, but nonetheless, these things basically shed plastic particles. So you, uh -huh. you actually don't want fashion um, to use plastic in some context. And I think there are, there are again, specific contexts where it would be absolutely appropriate. Yeah. You might say if it's a particular kind of coat that you're not going to wash very often, that's going to work. Uh -huh. But uh, uh -huh. I, I, I sort of, one of the things I do notice a lot about fashion is that um, there, is, there is a very high level of variability in terms of literacy. So, you know, we've got those that are right on the edge, they get it, they are really sort of pioneering. And then we've got those that are kind of entry level and that are, I think, struggling with it. And that sort of, I, I wonder if that's something that, you know, needs to be tackled through better communications. I mean, you know, yeah. if we look to example, you know, British folk is, is, I think, great right now. They're doing some amazing work. I love the, the, the latest issue with the, just, you know, people with various uh, disabilities and, and, you know, um sort of the diversity there in the state's issue that they're doing things that we really hoped they would do decades ago and now now they're on it now they're sort of working with these ideas but um i just kind of feel that you know it's still the case that sustainability is like some sort of add-on it's like oh it's the green edition of yeah. the magazine yeah yeah well i thought i mean even just talking to to, to the young designers um i naively thought that all young designers would be into sustain sustainability that's what i suspected but then i began to realize well they say they are they promote themselves as being but it's more or less just because they think it's it was going to attract customers because they think it's cool and it's the way to market themselves because then when you actually can propose things to them they're not interested in it at all like if you put sustainability content up they're not interested so not some are some aren't and um, so it is a lot of people are using it as and a lot of companies are using it as greenwashing too so we'll it's um yeah it will take a long time to to mm. really and nothing's going to be perfect there is no perfect solution so it's just doing the best we can and like with with the plastic just not producing any more just making remaking what we have already mm. because we can't it's not easy to destroy so we just keep using it rather than create any more mm -hmm. um but it's not an easy solution and even one of the problems they have is just actually extracting the materials or extracting the the, the yarns and fibers to actually re repurpose it to actually recycle it um i'm sure they will i think there is when well, i think they do have a way to do it but it's not commercially viable so that mm. will just take a long time to, to actually um hopefully eventually <laughs> uh, become commercially viable and then just the scalability but then actually for me i see that because it is unscalable at the moment then i see that as a positive for startups because that's where they have an advantage over the large brands because they can come in and just make one or two pieces with recycling um which the large brands can't do and the the small brands can use just a like a, a vintage piece of discarded material where there's only 10 meters available because they can quite easily just make three garments and sell them. A big company could, could never entertain that at all. So there are, yeah, there are advantages and, and disadvantages at the moment mm. that I see. Yeah. I suppose one of the things I was, I was thinking about with fashion is one of the things that traditionally it's done really quite well is uh, building those imaginary places building desire, mm -hmm. building um, what is in effect a sort of a dream world, but that is very much connecting with the zeitgeist, with people's feelings, with uh, sort of presenting possibilities. It's, it's been doing that obviously since we've had fashion shoots, mm -hmm. since we've had fashion magazines. And that's something that I think has so much potential because when I think to the future of cities, the awful thing in the sort of future of cities domain is that although there is some amazing work, there is some absolutely fantastic architecture, urban design, right at the edge, you know, really deeply sustainable stuff. If you were to type into a Google or Bing browser, uh, future cities, mm -hmm. what comes up? Cheesy images comes <laughs> up. That's what comes up. <laughs> you either get some image that looks like it's been drugged, you know, dr dragged out from 1950 oh, really? there's all skyscrapers and jetsons 
do you know flying cars type of thing <laughs> or oh we or, are having flying cars <laughs> yeah, yeah. or you get um more recently basically that same paradigm the big mm -hmm. glass steel tower blocks but just covered in green so it's, it's just it's, yeah there's just plants on the balcony yeah um and that is really that's um a, a, a sort of a, a consequence of the fact that there's not nearly enough appreciation in the built environment sector of the value of illustrators of the value of filmmakers and other creatives to actually build the vision to actually yeah. show people yeah this is what it could look like and there's yeah. not even this sort of a general push towards actually inviting those people that already have within and of their works created these beautiful visions yeah. and publicizing it of actually getting it out there but fashion i think i think has the capacity to do that and it's really interesting although i'm not generally a fan i think the metaverse is generally overhyped but that's mm -hmm. partly because because like you i've been working in you know working with digital a long time so i kind of um i'm probably a bit more cynical than some people but it does strike me that that is a, a brilliant sort of theater in effect mm -hmm. to build this vision of this is what the future of fashion could be yeah Here it is yesterday it would have been a spread in vogue but today we've got all these new amazing tools yeah and you know it that'll be powerful yeah. Yeah. well it's just something new because they had they'd gone probably as far as they could with creative photography as far as they could with fashion shows it's the same fashion shows were the same down up down up yeah down, up. <laughs> 10 minutes to finish it's like six months work for a 10 minute show yeah and um, but it was the same format every six well every six months or mm -hmm. sometimes every three months um so that had i think that had run its course and it was time for something new so that's just something new and exciting that has lots of potential to mm. be yeah like completely imaginative um you know there's the kind of no end to the potential for that it's, mm. There's, whereas within the physical world there are more limits so at the mm. moment that's that, that that's exciting to everybody yeah. and what will happen beyond that i don't know because I, I don't know that will have it that will live its its um, that will have its kind of life as well and how long that will be it's really exciting now will it be 10 years will it be 20 years and what mm -hmm. will happen beyond that to fashion i think i was seeing 10 15 years ago is fashion going to die out? And then like, Leo, like you reminded me yeah, earlier, Lee Edelkur said, fashion is out of fashion. Because mm. like she said, I mean, all creative industries, they would look to fashion for the trends. The trends originated with fashion designers, but that suddenly stopped. And the trends started to originate in, in other areas, um, like Silicon Valley and, and different different areas. So that's, that's why she was saying that fashion is out of fashion because no one was following fashion anymore for trends and um, so yeah so i was thinking like 15 years ago what's going to happen because we're i mean i always saw this is just in my mind i always saw the great designers that was like christian dior Yves Saint Laurent, john galliano and then what <laughs> yeah and um, yeah. it's you know the the the, the, the large and the real innovators mm. and i don't i don't know what the future is um but i did see it kind of i did see that format dying out completely and, and i think yeah. it, it, it has um to, to a certain extent it might just go back to it's more clothing and mm. the creates it's the creativity will will come in different formats yeah it could be new materials that that could be the anything the, the, i think certainly you know when i kind of look at it the thing that gets me well i mean i guess i was always more excited about the materials and the design systems than the items themselves mm. like you that that kind of attracted me in terms of the interest area but kind of when i think about it now i sort of think back you know as you say you kind of go through in the creative industries generally you go through something emerges it then grows it then sort of becomes um so commonplace yeah. that it, it, there's nothing original about it i mean i think that's one of the things i noticed about instagram actually is that the minute you click like uh, you heart a, a, a sort of a fashion catwalk show whatever oh boom it's like totally flooding your your feed with this stuff <laughs> um and i do sort of feel i'm like i've seen so much so much of it before mm -hmm. Um, and there is very even like Caperni, the, the Paris label, you sort of, yeah, I love the kind of 
the integrating the biotic robots and I love the kind of spraying the yeah. dress onto, uh, was it Bella Hadid, I think? Um, I think so, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was great. That, that but was then amazing. again, yeah. I looked at that and I thought, that's basically Alexander yeah, McQueen yeah. now. I've seen yeah, it's that before. Much <laughs> you know, it's just, it's yeah. not decorating the dress, it's yeah. the actually painting the yeah. dress. But fair enough, you know, if you're going to make a nod to anybody, that's yeah. someone to make it to. Yeah. But I do kind of think now, I think it's in some ways kind of exciting because you can sort of think, I, I'm sort of torn between the sort of, yeah, the Lee Aldercore fashion is dead. And I think actually, you know what, fashion's like the Phoenix. Fashion always comes back because when yeah. we're down to it, it's, it's actually like all the arts. It's about communicating. Yeah. That's why in a sense it will never die because people are never going to stop wanting through their attire, through their visual sort of assembly, communicating, this is what I'm about. This is who I am. And I do wonder if now we sort of went from that period. So, I mean, we would have been tiny. We were, we were children at the time, but you sort of had the punk movement. You had the new romantics, all very yeah. kind of DIY, very creative. Then you kind of went, well, raving, actually, the whole rave scene, that was pretty creative. That was pretty kind of out there. And then it got more and more and more commercial, yeah. more and more kind of samey. And that was kind of the high street thing coming in, as you say, that we went from people customizing secondhand shops to mass production at Primark, yeah. Zara, et cetera. So everything became very formulaic. Yeah. I think we've kind of peaked at that now. And then you think, well, actually, there are the signs. There are signs that's going to kind of go back. Go back. Because yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like we were sort of saying earlier in our chat that um, when we look at sort of the, the kind of not just not what's being thrown at you on your Instagram yeah. feed, but what's actually being sold, all these businesses who are talking about these sort of micro businesses, actually, there's no major trends. There's just no. a whole bunch of trends. No. Yeah. Yeah. And like when, from when I say that fashion was kind of dead or whatever and um, in my mind I, I was thinking of like ready to wear because ready to wear it only started in what the 50s mm. so it's a relatively new concept and like you're saying it hit the, the its peak in the mm. 90s probably and um, but i do think it could go back to pre even pre-1950s pre back to what it was or something along those lines back to what it was before mm. um before this ready to wear huge um tailoring industry. Tailoring, absolutely. Yeah. Tailoring yeah. 2.0. Um, I think I was, I was chatting about this with, uh, I think it was Charlotte um, McCurdy. Um, we were talking about the fact that today, you know, before in ye olde days, to get a couture piece of clothing or to get a tailored Savile Row suit, mm -hmm. you had to be very wealthy um, yeah. because it cost a lot of money because it was a very time intensive process. Now, theoretically, if some fabulous brands happen to hear that, but Burlington Arcade idea and thought, wow, we're going to do that. We're actually yeah. going to create a place where we champion the new talent, where we bring in the new tech, where we experiment. Yeah. They could actually make um, that kind of tailored attire yeah. accessible, not necessarily, it probably won't be as cheap as the sort of the, the fast yeah. fashion. It will be a bit higher, but it's not going to be up there with, let's say, design a press board mm -hmm. because now we've got the technology to do that. And then obviously... Yeah we know we're lucky enough that we have had you know couture and designer pieces we've worn them we know that they make you feel a million dollars yeah they're cut to your size um they will you know because you, you care for them you love them they're bespoke to you and um i think it'd be wonderful if we could sort of democratize that and actually have a situation yeah. where you know everybody can get and that is the thing yeah. of the old isn't it because if we think back to before press portair yeah Yes, the impoverished didn't have access to that. They were generally wearing a hand-me-down. Yeah. But if you look to the rest of the population, they were wearing bespoke attire made for them, yeah. but that they would buy less of, but, but yeah. care for. And of course, a lot of that stuff is today in museums, isn't it? Or in, yeah. in yeah. somebody's and the, well, they would, family. Yeah. yeah, and they would make their own. So it was mm. either the really rich, really expensive couture, or they would make their own. Whereas the future that I see is along those lines, similar to what you're saying. It's the it's a, almost like demi couture, but it's even less than demi couture. It's little independent brands mm. creating small quantities or unique one off versions for, for mm. their customers. So yeah, it is going to cost a little bit more, but less than than even demi couture. So the little brands, okay, they won't make as much revenue as big companies, mm. but they'll make enough to have a really lovely lifestyle without having to go and sell their soul and work for the fast fashion companies because 
they they've dominated the market for too long mm -hmm. and all the graduates that had dreams of having their own business they were just they had to give up their dreams to work for the fast fashion companies because they could not compete mm. they are setting up their own business they could not compete with the fast fashion companies so they had to go and work for them instead so i just see it's like a reversal of power where the independents can have power not make huge amounts of money but make enough to make a really great living doing what they love to do mm. but it's really educating consumers to actually to buy it's starting to happen i think i think the consumers are starting to realize the value of buying original designs from small brands that they can buy in it's not produced in such high quantity so they are buying something more original that, that they're not going to see someone else wearing it at a wedding or something uh, it's going to be more original and that they've got the more of a connection with the designer they've got that more com community they've got a closer um connection with the designers um and it just gives them a better feeling um when they buy into that the, rather than the yeah. big brands so, and i think that point actually um that you mentioned there i mean certainly if you think about alexander mcqueen i think of him as without doubt being one of the, the most important designers of the last half century um but came to a tragic end of course you know he was somebody that had a difficult start came from a really tough sort of background and that mm -hmm. he, he started with no money Famously, I, I remember the pictures of him as you will, where he would have his back to the catwalk, wouldn't have any pictures. I didn't realize at the time it was because he was on the doll and he didn't want the benefits office to recognize him because that, <laughs> that was how he was keeping afloat. I didn't um, know. <laughs> you know, and he'd sort of give these, these, these collections, everybody would go nuts about it, but then he, they, at the end of the day, you know, he and his creative crew would be so sort of broke that they would really be sort of hand to mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, like Jan John Galliano, started out by basically creating a number of collect uh, different collections, different kind of concepts to see which one took off. Yeah. But then, of course, took off. Everybody wanted a piece of him. Yeah. And then, of course, he was in a situation where a big couture house comes along, as with Galliano, and he's got a choice of either you got kind of go and you get completely absorbed by them, your whole creative being is taken up by that entity, or you juggle where your own house and the the the, the couture house the, the major sort of house you're working for and so of course he became worn out he became disillusioned yeah. um and it ended extremely yeah. sadly yeah. and i see that kind of same dichotomy elsewhere so for example when i think about sustainability the fact of the matter is that there is far too just by product of the fact that you know it's been an emergent sector there are, there's not much uh, talent availability above the middle sector. There's a lot of, there are a lot of juniors, there are a lot of people coming in, there's a lot of mid-level, but if you're looking for a, an executive, let's say you are for sake of argument, um, your, your house of Dior, your, mm -hmm. your, your Dior, um, mm -hmm. and you're looking for a head of chief sustainability officer. Well, the market is tiny. There are really not yes. many people around that yeah. are actually even gonna be available at the executive sustainability level, let alone with expertise in fashion. Yeah, yeah. And yet, what are a lot of them doing? They're putting out a full-time job spec. They're basically saying, right, you can work for us, but you come, you completely get absorbed in our brands. Mm -hmm. um, and they're lacking the sort of recognition that not just in sustainability, but as with the younger talent, people don't want to be absorbed by the corporate. They want to have autonomy. They want to have some freedoms. And so things like job sharing, things like, you know, being able to, do a job but have some side hustles that's mm -hmm. where they want it mm -hmm. and i'm so relieved i mean i've given a couple of sort of advisories recently where I, my client has come to me and sort of said you know we're struggling on this that and the other level innovation problem mm -hmm. what do we need to do about it and particularly when it comes to talent acquisition i say to them look you know with young people they don't want to become your servant exactly become your slave. yeah yeah they're so much more got, yeah You've got to work with their desires, with their values, with their goals. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, be in no doubt, they have other options. They have yeah. Contrado, they have Etsy, yeah. they have the capacity to be their own boss. Yeah. It might be a bit tougher, but they can do that and they can maybe yeah. have a bit of a side hustle with yeah. something else. And that, if you want the talent, then that's the way to go. Yeah. And if you don't, well then you, yeah. can, you can leave that job vacancy yeah. free. They have much more of a sense of self-worth now. They know they have all the other options. Whereas like 20 years ago, yeah, the, the 
the, the directors of the companies were the boss and you did what you were told. Mm. Um, yeah, it's completely changed. But I think it's really interesting what you were saying about um, Alexander McQueen basically being anonymous. Because I think I've had recently in the past month, I've had three designers, three different independent designers asking how can they start a business anonymously without showing their face for various reasons. Yeah. Um, I thought that's so interesting. Like, within a month, three designers. So I'll give them that example. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just look at Alexander McQueen's career. Yeah. And, and, you was... know, and I think it is interesting because the other thing actually I mean, some of my creative projects have passed. You, pro you probably remember back in the day, a certain friend of ours was, was launching a pop career and, uh, yes. <laughs> and, and asked if, if I did some backing vocals. And yeah. obviously, backing vocals didn't really kind of fit with my <laughs> career direction. So I went under a, a pseudonym. I had a pseudonym. And I've ah. used various pseudonyms on these other creative projects yeah, yeah, to stay hidden because I know today we today we can say, you know, I'm a folio yeah. professional and I do this that, and the other. Exactly. But if you'd have been doing that back in the early 2000s, people would have thought, hang on a minute. Yeah, <laughs> you're not allowed to do that. You're meant to have one job. You yeah, can't you're possibly be doing two. Yeah, you were just put in this little box and you couldn't move outside it. But that's why my business was called Macmillan instead of Jane Macmillan, because I was working. I had to start anonymously because Did I was you? working full time. I had a, it was a full time um employee job yeah. when I started it was a first, side hustle it was a, yeah it was a, <laughs> a mid, midnight hustle <laughs> yeah. yeah and actually my office was the red tele we had no mobile phones in those days so my office was the red telephone box in my lunch hour opposite <laughs> my work <laughs> I love that. I love and then that. I upgraded to a mobile phone yeah, yeah oh yeah. my god we need we need Jane McMillan the movie <laughs> I think <laughs> we might splice in some other elements to this. I mean, I think working title would be mad to turn this down. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in those days, like you were saying, like Alexander McQueen, like struggling. And it was like that in mm. those days. I remember talking to Vanessa Denza and, and I had just started my business and Vanessa was saying to me, well, it's up to you because she was trying to persuade me to go into a job. Mm. And she's thinking it's up to you if you want to be the struggling artist in a garret or yeah. to have an or to be an employee and I chose the struggling <laughs> artist in a garage because that's what it was in those days yeah whereas now it is different now it can be profitable <laughs> no I had I had I went to Denzer as well and I had that same conversation <laughs> totally really? about the same time <laughs> so yeah we, a lot of us did and uh, yeah. yeah I think it's I think it's kind of interesting and um I suppose the other thing I've kind of noticed that I think is one of the sort of more problem problematic areas. And this again is one of the reasons why I thought it was really important to, to have this conversation with you and to share this, because when we think back, there were a number of not just mentors, but there were organizations you could go to that could really sort of guide you once you got out of college. So, I mean, I kind of did the classic, you know, Chartered Society of Designers, folio reviews. I had a mentor that uh, had, had sort of been a you know PR to, a number of the big sort of labels and brands and I had people to sort of just to help me to navigate this very complex space mm -hmm. but I mean obviously Denzer shut down didn't it Denzer's gone no more mm -hmm. Denzer um, and we're sort of in a situation where I feel that there's been a bit of a, a sort of um, a, a, an empty space where there needs to be organizations that just like yours you're not offering a degree course mm -hmm. you don't come to the Jane Macmillan Fashion Entrepreneurs Academy to get a bachelor's or to get a master's. Mm -hmm. No, you come whether or not you've been through a degree or you have um, trained yourself through independent means mm -hmm. to get the training, to get the insight, to actually know how do I run a business? Yeah. Well, the problem with the degree courses, they because the, the, oh, the, the industry and business, which are slightly two different things that, that, that slightly overlap, but they're completely, they move so fast, mm -hmm. both the fashion industry and the general business are moving so fast. And degree courses, they take years to change their curriculum. So first of all, they have to recognize that things are changing. Yeah. <laughs> then they have to get together and have meetings and decide that they want to change or to change some curriculums. And then it takes, I don't know how long it might even be 10 years it might might be mm. two years as i think someone said to me 10 years to change an actual curriculum so they can't keep up with the moving pace of industry mm. um so that's why that's why the these programs are really 
really advantageous and helpful to designers yeah whether they have a degree or not yeah and absolutely and particularly you know as, as we were saying now that this sort of the, the the barrier to entry of launching your own creative business in this sector it's yeah. it's much lower than it used to be so you don't need big amounts of money uh you can experiment a lot more i mean theoretically you could you could do the alexander mcqueen or the john galliano you could have a number of different projects that you've yeah. got going on you're tinkering away anonymously <laughs> hence why you can have all these different things going on probably not using a phone box probably using a mobile I know. Yeah. in the rain and the snow i had to walk across the road to phone get yeah, to make my phone calls with my notepad yeah. beside me yeah and yeah. the phone boxes had those little metal shelves in yeah. the corner oh. <laughs> Um, well, it's been it's been a real pleasure to to, to catch yeah. up with you, and uh, so. yeah. we'll we'll have to do this yeah. again because there's so much ground we have not covered. But it's um, been a real delight, and I hope some of the points that you've shared will be useful to those, both those that are watching live and those that will see the recording later. Um, I certainly have found it very insightful, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been I think um, reassured, Jane. I've been reassured. <laughs> you've brought you brought positivity into. <laughs> where things are going to go <laughs> into the future of fashion yeah the future of fashion well have a good evening to you thank you for everybody you that joined us and uh we will be back with future now Lovely. soon thank you melissa thank you bye bye, -bye. bye everyone bye one of